Hi, this is Dean Webb with NetworkingForums.com. I'd like to do an introduction to Network Access Control, or NAC as it's abbreviated, and talk about why these projects cause so much concern or even fear and panic in IT organizations. Basically, NAC projects are very complicated, and this level of complexity can lead to project disrailment or even failure. If you're aware of these pitfalls that could happen to a NAC project, if you're aware of how a NAC project is properly matured in all the areas that it touches, it can help you in planning, and in that proper planning you should be able to have a better chance of getting a NAC project plan that will eventually come to a successful conclusion. So let's get into NAC. NAC is going to deal with control on two different levels. On the switch, it's going to look for what is connecting, should it be connecting to this network, and then if something disconnects and another thing connect in its place, looking at that MAC address change, being able to reevaluate what is connected to this network. For endpoint control, NAC will have to ask the question, is this particular device connecting compliant with what I need for my, ne for my network? And then making periodic checks to make sure that what is connected remains compliant. Uh, sometimes things become out of date, or worse, there could be a sleeping thread on that machine that gets activated after it connects. NAC has got to be ready to catch those sorts of things. There are two schools of thought about how to do NAC. The first one, pre-access, relies on 802.1x technology to execute the network access control. It does involve uh, upgrading switch code and possible hardware upgrades to make sure that the hardware does support full 802.1x functionality. Uh, failure to have these upgrades can result in an 802.1x system that creates a lot of problems. It also involves making sure the endpoints are up to speed for this. Again, an endpoint that can't be made compliant is going to create one kind of headache or another. So you want to be prepared for that. Now, post-access network access control that doesn't rely on 802.1x. So you don't have as many requirements for the switch code or hardware. Uh, it doesn't have as many requirements for the endpoint. However, it is not instantaneous. There can be situations in a post-access environment where if something can get in and execute code very rapidly, it can do so before its posture is checked and proper network access control is assigned. Now I would like to look at the different vendors and how they use or don't use 802.1x. Cisco Identity Services Engine, or ICE, is a pure 802.1x solution. If you are going to put this in place in your environment, take a very close look at the hardware compatibility list for that product. You may find you have hardware that is no longer compatible, or you may have compatible hardware that is not running at a compatible iOS version. You will definitely want to test these iOS versions out before you upgrade to them because sometimes an iOS improvement for one thing, such as .1x compliance, may break something else that you're using. So it involves a lot of testing and a lot of careful planning. Now, Forescout Counteract does offer a non.1x solution. However, for some environments, non.1x is not going to be the level of compliance that they need in order to have a network access control solution. This may be the case in government environments or banking environments or other high security situations your regulations may require an 802.1x solution. And if you're going to go with 802.1x, it doesn't matter what vendor you choose, you're going to upgrade your gear in order to make it compliant. Now, I did mention the Cisco gear. This is going to be the case as well with other vendors and their interpretation of 802.1x. So plan ahead and be careful about this. Uh, a quick nod to the wireless guys though, wireless is already built around 802.1x so your wireless networks will actually probably be the first ones to go full .1x whether you're using ICE or Counteract. You can do .1x pretty easily on a wireless network. Your NAC project has to consider that it's going to progress in stages. You are not going to turn everything on on day one and have 100% success. In fact, turning everything on on day one is pretty much a guarantee of 100% failure. So you proceed in stages. First is the monitor mode. You're going to let everyone on your network. You're going to examine how you classify these assets. 
you'll inspect the rules that you want to create for determining levels of access. You want to make sure that everything has the correct assignment. You want to resolve unclassified assets so that everything has its place and you know what's on your network and you know what to do with it. Then when monitor mode is over, you can begin to phase into enforcement mode. That's when you start to restrict access. That's when you start to get phone calls about for people who didn't upgrade in time or who didn't comply in time. They'll say, why can't I get on the network? And you'll tell them, well, we're now in enforcement mode and what you had before is no longer acceptable. Deal with that. So if you do enforcement mode too early, uh, you can launch a d distributed denial of service attack on yourself. You don't want that kind of outage. So make sure you have your rules set up correctly for determining access. Okay, so what are you going to integrate your NAC with? It's not just the switches and the wireless controllers. You're likely going to have to have a tie-in with Active Directory, your PKI infrastructure, your certificates. You need to be able to work with endpoints that are going to support a client and endpoints that don't support a client. You're going to talk to your software distribution people about patching levels and what level of compliance they have to have for antivirus and anti-malware. You're going to talk to the scanning and monitoring people. You need to know what are blacklisted programs for your network. You need to know what to do if you spot suspicious traffic flows. Now this is where NAC really gets complicated. It was hairy enough dealing with all the switches and wireless access controllers, but now you've got to talk to people who are not normally in communication with the network teams. So whether you're leaning over somebody's queue wall or you're organizing a formal meeting with a completely different department, you have got to have the integration buy-in when you execute a NAC project. You have got to have desktop and Active Directory and PKI and all those other groups involved so that way they make those resources available to you and they make them available to you early on and that they're aware of what you have to do. And I may have left out other groups. Maybe you're going to stand up virtual machines. you got to talk to your VMware guys. Maybe you're going to do some other weird stuff. I don't know what could happen. The thing is, it can touch every single aspect of your enterprise, and you have got to be prepared for that. Have those meetings as early as possible, and have them provide as complete information as possible, so that way you get these resources when you need them, and you're able to progress smoothly in your project deployment. Yes, it's complicated. Yes, it's difficult to explain, but it has to be done if you want a successful NAC project. Seriously, I really do wish it was a lot easier, but we got what we got. Okay, let's talk about the depth of controls. Uh, you're looking at admission events and endpoint rechecking. Those admission events, NAC is acting as a gatekeeper in this case. What can defeat it? Inline devices can hijack these sessions. Uh, inline devices can also change their status, where if they're sharing a network port, they can actually take over a MAC address from a device that has previously been admitted and spoof it as their own, and there's, there's ways to do it. Uh, so that's why you have to do rechecking. That's where NAC is acting as the patrolman and enforcer. If you are just checking admission events, you do not have NAC. You must be constantly checking and rechecking. This is going to reveal those hijack sessions. This is going to take those non-compliant statuses, detect them, and allow you to execute some kind of reaction to that. So make absolutely sure you have not just checking at the admission, but also what happens after that device is admitted. It's on depth of control where you can tell the difference between the routing and switching guys and the security guys. A routing and switching guy is going to look at the 802.1x code or the SNMP read-write events or the ACLs that are happening on the switch and say, that's it. That's all we need. They're on. They're what we want. Leave it like that. And they go on having established connectivity. Security guys are paranoid. We're going to say, all right, now that we've let them on, are they still going to behave themselves? Think about an exclusive club. If you have a bouncer at the door and he's going to let only certain people in, and keep others out. That's great. But once you let those people in, what happens if they start acting up? What if they uh, bring a weapon? Or what if they get too drunk and unruly? If all you have is that bouncer at the door, he's not going to stop the guy on the inside from disrupting things and making a terrible situation. You've got to have patrolling on the inside to take care of those situations and to provide a pleasant environment for everyone else. So a security guy is going to insist 
on that continuous checking of endpoints. A routing and switching guy may not necessarily see it that way. So if you are a routing and switching guy and you're on a NAC project, you got to think like a security guy. Keep checking. Be paranoid. That's what this is for. Okay, last slide. Let's talk about what NAC will not do. It's not going to provide all the layers of security. It's not going to give you a firewall, an IPS, or a proxy. Even though NAC products can perform some functions that are similar or complementary to these things, you want to have a full-blown firewall or IPS or proxy server in place to do its job. It's not going to block legitimate users from illegal acts. It's not going to stop data exfiltration, people copying things and walking out of the company with it. It's not going to stop illegal alterations of data or somebody walking up to another person's computer and using it if it's unlocked. You've got to have other things in place to keep an eye out for that. NAC can cooperate with them. You may have a situation where you want to have NAC work with another vendor's product and you could talk to software development teams and say, hey, can you write some code that'll let these things talk to each other? That's always a great question to ask. And NAC's not going to give you physical security. It's not going to stop people from finding out what server has all the good information on it and then breaking in and stealing it. So be ready. NAC is part of a complete approach to security. It is not the complete approach. Remember that. Well, I hope you found this introduction to NAC helpful. In future videos, I'd like to cover other NAC-related topics, like radius and certificates and endpoint preparation. If you have any other questions about NAC or other networking topics, please come by www.networking-forums.com where there's a lot of really great people who are ready to give a lot of really great advice. Until later, I'm Dean Webb for NetworkingForums.com. Bye for now.